righty, everyone. We'll kick off. Um, I'm sure a couple more will join as we continue on. Um, so thank you for coming along. Uh, my name is Bryce O'Hara. I'm the team leader for um, talent management and workforce planning at Queen Impelling Regional Council. Um, so one of the areas that I look after is recruitment and I'm involved in the um, acquisition of our cadet and trainees into the organisation. And this is something that we're really passionate about. So thank you for coming along. Effectively, what tonight is, uh, is so we can present some of the cadet and trainee opportunities that we have um, within the organisation that are currently advertised. Um, I've invited along the managers of those positions so they can talk through the exciting things that are involved with that. Um, and hopefully um, that will be a good sell for you guys to consider applying for these jobs. So before we get underway, I'll just sort of explain what these cadet and trainee opportunities are all about. So effectively, um, what they are is on the job experience, work experience, and we pay for 100% of um, tertiary um, studies as part of that process. I know when I was in school, there was an expectation that um, if I went to uni and got a degree um, that there was this expectation that I'd have a job at the end of it but the reality is, is that what recruiters are looking for is that dual package um, of experience coupled with um, a qualification of some sort and the result that we have from these cadet and trainee programs is an extremely employable individual um, that has on the ground work experience and um, particularly within a dynamic and diverse operationally diverse local government organization and they're walking out with that qualification um, which is really exciting and we can be all part of that, which is really good. So the difference between a cadet and a trainee for those that don't know. So a trainee typically does two to four years um, on a fixed term arrangement and they undertake a um, certificate three or four within the relevant field um, that they're employed through. So for example, um, if it was um, a trainee administrative officer, they would do a cert four. Um, in business administration or something like that. Whereas the cadet um, does around six years with council, like that's assuming it takes that long. It's rarely that we ever need to get to six years to complete degree, um, but they undertake a bachelor's degree in a relevant area. So for example, a cadet building surveyor um, or better yet, um, so cadet administration or something like that, cadet HR would do a bachelor's degree in business admin, business or HR, something like that. So the difference being cadet does a degree, trainee does a cert for. <clears throat> um, just a bit of housekeeping as well for those that are joining us also. Um, we'll run through some of the content. We'll hear from some of our managers of those positions. We'll take some questions at the end. And there's two ways that you can do that. Um, you can put them in the chat box and I've got some of my team members monitoring all that. Um, if you want to direct the questions to the HR team um, or the, the actual manager of the position as well, that's fine. Um, or you can we'll raise your hand at the end using the little um, uh, reactions box at the bottom there to raise your hand and we'll go through everyone that wants to ask a question. Um, for the best experience with this, I don't know if it's done it automatically, but if you did want to see or be focused on the actual presenter that's talking at that particular time, if you go view up in the top right hand corner of your screen, and it should be similar for those that are joining us um, via your cellular device, something like that, um, just click view in the top right hand corner and choose the option side by side speaker. All righty. Uh, joining me today, uh, as I said, is some of the managers of the positions um, that we're recruiting for at the moment of the training cadet okay. positions. I'm also joined by um, uh, the coordinator of HR, Therese Breen, and members of my team as well, Kimberly Burns, who is currently the acting learning and development officer, who you'll hear from her, um, and Monique and Emmy Cooper as well. We've been monitoring that chat box um, if anyone's got any questions. Um, just one last bit of housekeeping. Um, if you're not speaking or asking a question or something like that, I just ask that you keep your microphone muted if possible, please. All right, let's get underway. Monique, if you mind changing there. 
Before we go any further, I'd just like to acknowledge to the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting on today. And for me and my team, that is the Ngunnawal and Wiradjuri people. And we pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And I encourage um, you guys to consider how to think about um, the land that you're joining us from today as well. All right, good change slides there. So who is, well, who is Queen the Empowering Regional Council and what do we do? So we are a local government organisation that governs the localities of Queanbeyan, and Bungendore and Braywood and surrounding regions. A cool fact about our local government area is that we're bigger than the ACT, which is a huge amount of ground to cover. Um, and that's a map of what we look like there. And you'll notice that the um, QPRC logo is kind of the same as the shape or the layout of our um, local government area, which is a nice feature there. Of the three levels of government, so being federal, state and local, I believe we work closest with the community. And that's something that's feedback that we hear from our staff all the time that have stuck around for a long time um, because it's allowed us to give back to the local community and has that intrinsic value. I know when I go home at the end of the day, I feel really sort of, I feel like I've been part of something and been able to give back to my local community and provide those job opportunities. And it's the same for our parks and gardens, water and sewer and all that kind of stuff. It's a real opportunity to give back to your local community, which brings the intrinsic value and the reason to show up every day to work and be really proud of what you do. Which sort of ties into my next stop point there about rewarding work and giving back to your local community. And just a snapshot of our people, we're made up of just over 500 staff um, in, with inclusion of 11 councillors as well. I'll change slides there. So this is an overview of um, what we do. A lot of people join our organisation um, and aren't aware of the sheer diversity um, operationally of what we do. It's quite impressive. I know when I first came to local government, my mind was blown about just all the crazy things that we do and all those services that can sometimes go unnoticed that we deliver to the community. So our services are divided into four separate pillars. Um, first one being infrastructure services. So that includes our road construction and maintenance, water and sewer, waste, all that kind of stuff. Those are the operational guys that you see in high vis every day um, out and about fixing our roads, making sure our roads are safe, making sure that you've got water to drink, making sure our sewer systems are functioning, all that kind of thing. Next one down is our development environment section. So that's our town planning, building, uh, building surveying, environmental health services, all that kind of thing, uh, making sure that our uh, built and natural environment is safe and equitable, all that kind of thing. Um, and then we've got the third pillar, which is corporate services, which is where my team is based. And that effectively this whole pillar makes sure that the organization is running smoothly um, and operating as best that we can to the highest capability. So that includes our human resources team, uh, WHS, finance, yeah. IT, all that kind of thing. And then finally, we have the more community oriented section, uh, which looks after oh. libraries, so our parks and gardens. Um, A fun fact about our parks and gardens crew for anyone that's interested in the trainee um, gardener positions that we've got um, is that they are an award winning team. So there's a thing called the Green Flag Award, um, which uh, effectively, it, it refers to some of the best managed parks in the world, and Queanbeyan's proud to have two of those. That's a real testament to our parks and gardens team. So, if that's the traineeship that you're interested in applying for, I think that's a really um, interesting selling point that you'd be working with some real well established professionals in that area. And then, other areas in our community arts and recreation area so, obviously, our aquatic centres, customer service, our animal management centre, all that kind of thing. So there's a lot of really exciting stuff happening at QPRC and all come with their own diverse range um, of um, professions, which is really exciting. All right. So that's all from me for a little while. I'm going to pass over to the coordinator of HR, Therese Breen, to talk about um, the workplaces that we got, a new building that you might have seen on Crawford Street and a couple of other things. Thanks so much, Bryce. So as Bryce has just mentioned, we're... Um, We've got a, a really large footprint uh, across the area and we cover a lot of ground in terms of all the different services that we provide the community. So to be able to do that, we work across three main areas, which is Queanbeyan, Bungendore and Braidwood, where we've got three administration offices and three depots in those three areas and then three libraries there as well. We 
don't just service those three areas though, we've got surrounding areas as well. So we've got waste transfer stations, water and sewage treatment plants, cemeteries and culture and arts facilities. So you would know probably mainly the queue here in Queanbeyan where we put on a lot of different shows, different events. As Bryce also mentioned, here in Queanbeyan we're um, in the process or you know, all the right people are in the process of building our new cultural, uh, civic and cultural precinct. So that's where our head office is going to be. And the majority of staff that work in Queanbeyan, all across Queanbeyan at the moment, will be based in that building, along with some other um, companies uh, as well. That's state of the art. It looks, it's, it's beautiful, beautiful views from there. So that if that's floating your boat in terms of coming to work in, in the council, that will, that's ready to go towards the end of this year. Um, and that's going to have a direct link into the queue and the Bicentennial Hall. That's on Crawford Street, I think. We've just mentioned that as well. Uh, here at um, QPRC, we're committed to inclusive and recruitment practices, and that's why we uh, have this slide here that's all about diversity and inclusion. So as the top point, dot point um, points out, Council encourages and values diverse and, and a diverse and inclusive organisation. So people of all genders, backgrounds, beliefs and experiences are welcomed and embraced. We do have some positions in council, uh, in QPRC, that are identified and what for disability and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So what that means is there are some roles that are specifically dedicated to people who identify as being disabled or have a uh, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander heritage. Um, we have a, a diversity inclusion group that actually, that's made up of QPRC employees that make sure that we promote diversity and inclusion across our employees for council. And some of the events that we celebrate, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of events to celebrate and there's a lot of um, things to discuss in terms of diversity and inclusion, in terms of attraction strategies, etc. But some of the actual events that we do celebrate are Are You OK Day, We're at Purple Day, Cancer Council's Biggest Morning Tea, International Day of Disability, which I think is coming up in December, and many more. And I think that might be it from me. So over to you, back to you, Bryce. Thanks, Therese, that was great. Yeah, so diversity inclusion is something really important to us. You might notice on our advertisements that we have a statement uh, which goes over what we're all about in terms of diversity inclusion. Um, and we'll talk a bit later as well um, about some of the other things we do in that space. So next off the rank, uh, over the next slide, we're going to talk about our learning and development program and some of our cadet and traineeship programs as well. I'll pass over to Kimberly Burns, who's currently acting in the learning and development coordinator position. Hey everybody. Um, so QPRC prides, um, we pride ourselves on having quite a significant catalogue of learning and development opportunities. Um, so we provide a lot of professional development and competency-based training. Um, some of our professional development um, training sessions that we offer are business writing, verbal judo, custom service, um, cadet and trainee workshops, which I'll touch on um, on the next slide. Um, we also offer time management, stepping into supervising, communication and resilience, presentation skills, um, and many more um, professional development courses as well. Um, if I can go to the next slide, please, Moni. Um, with our um, competency-based training, um, especially for our trainee gardeners and our trainee water and sewer, which I believe we have a couple of positions available in, um, we offer traffic control training, chainsaw training, um, confined spaces and gas test atmosphere and working at heights. Um, and then we also offer working near power lines training. Um, this is all covered um, the cost is all covered by council because it is relevant to your position. Um, so that's something that is really helpful as you get to um, obtain your tickets that you need for your role in order to be able to do your role. Um, some of the benefits of our trainee 
and cadet program um, are that you're basically learning and earning as Bryce touched on at the start of the presentation. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to kickstart your career whilst you're studying. So you're really um, getting really valuable job on the job experience whilst you're studying. Um, and it really sets you up for job opportunities after you finish your qualification or your degree. Um, I believe it really gives you a kickstart um, and gives you a foot in the door for when you apply for those higher up positions after you finish your study. I myself was a trainee and I found it really, really helpful to have that experience behind me when I applied for my current role that I sit in when I'm not in the learning and development officer role. Um, a couple of benefits that you get under our training cadet program is you will be entitled to four hours of study leave per week. So this is to help you attend uni classes. If you're doing qualification that is online, so our cert um, four in business and our cert, um, I know that our cert for in HR, they do their learning online. They will get a four hour study block per week. It's up to them whether they wanna take the full four hours on one day, whether they break it up during the week, it's up to them and their supervisor, whatever works for their department. Um, they get that every single week. Um, with some of our cadets, they take um, the four hours to help them attend their tutorials um, and to complete some assessments. Any more study that you need to do for your qualification, will you will need to put into your own time or you will need to take annual leave to be able to complete this, but this is to sort of help you um, have some time at work to be able to sit down and do your learning that you need to do to complete your qualification. Um, we also pay 100% of your course fees. So anyone who will be studying a degree in a cadet position, that means you will have no hex set at the end of your qualification, which is really, really good. Um, it also does save you a little bit of money um, whilst you're studying. We also have a trainee and cadet workshop every two months, which is a really great networking opportunity for our trainees and cadets to come together. Um, it's really nice because you guys are all, will all be um, going through the same thing. So um, it's really nice to be able to bounce off ideas on how to some study tips and tricks um, that other people are finding helpful to help them stay motivated. Um, during those presentations as well, we give the trainees an opportunity to do a presentation on what their area does um, on their day-to-day. -day. So it gives our trainees and cadets the opportunity to grow their presentation skills. Um, we also have some guest speakers that come in from around council to talk about what their area does. Um, and so our trainees and cadets are learning what else goes on around council. Um, and we also work on some skills development. So um, I know that in some past workshops, we have talked about um, resume writing and how to apply for roles within QPRC. We really like to retain our trainees and cadets. We put a lot of time and money into them. Um, so it's really nice when they are able to apply for another role within QPRC at the end of their trainee or cadetship. We also have covered some time management training um, where we sort of help our trainees and get and cadets fit in um, how to maybe get some more study time in so that they're a little bit less stressed about studying um, if that were the case. Um, and also we do cover off some um, Word and Excel tips and tricks. I know that that was a really popular um, session that we did with our trainees and cadets in one of the workshops. Um, we have a very big variety of training cadet opportunities across council departments, um, which I know that Bryce is gonna talk about in the next slide. I'll hand back to you, Bryce. Great, thanks for that, Kim. Just to emphasize, there was one key dot point there that's really important. We pay 100% of course fees. Um, I know in today's economy, hex debt and all that kind of thing, studying is no cheap process. Um, and that's the commitment that we make to our cadet and trainees that we pay for all that inclusive and textbooks and all that kind of thing. Um, I know I found that really beneficial during my traineeship. So this is a snapshot of our cadet and trainee opportunities that we have at the moment, which I'm sure some of you have your eyes on already or perhaps multiple, which is great. 
So what we have at the moment, we've got two trainee gardener positions. One's located in our Queanbeyan region and one's located in our Bungendore region. We have a trainee water and sewer, which is located in both Braywood or Bungendore, depending on where the preferred applicant is located. Um, we have a trainee administration um, in our building and development section. Um, we have two cadet building surveyors. Um, a cadet town planner and a cadet project accountant. If you're not sure what some of these are, um, this is the right session to come to because we're going to expand on that. So if we just go to the next slide, um, first off the rank, we're going to be talking about our trainee gardeners, which as I said, we've got two. And joining us today is Rod McMullen. Um, he is the team leader, senior horticulturist of our award-winning parks and gardens team. So I'll let you take off, Rod. Okay. Hi, I'm Robert Mullen. I'm, as he just has said, I'm the Senior Horticulturist for Quimby and Caroline Council. Welcome to this information night. You're here to find out more about becoming a trainee gardener in our urban landscapes team. You will maintain the council's extensive gardens, turf areas, and tree maintenance, which there is going to be a lot of. Your main jobs include mowing, edging and blowing, a lot of pruning, um, a lot of mulching, which we do mainly in the winter winter period, irrigation, to name a few, and also we do a lot of planting and transplanting. Uh, also, next to me here is Nicole. I'd like to introduce you to her. She's our second year trainee gardener. And Nicole, over to you. Hi guys, as Rod said, uh, my name's Nicole and I'm a second year trainee. Uh, I'm just here today to just give you a bit of my experience and a bit of information on our role. Um, so it's a, for a trainee gardener, it's a four year traineeship, three years study and one year on the job. Uh, you'll go to Bruce CIT one day a week, which is a lot of fun. Teachers are amazing. Um, you also, as was said, you get access to training and certificates like chainsaw, which is a lot of fun, lots of fun, traffic control, chemical certificate, asbestos awareness. And as Kim was talking about the um, the cadet and trainee catch-ups that we have each second month, they're actually really, really informative and they've been really helpful. I've actually really enjoyed those so much. Where do we work? Where do we work? We work in lots of areas. Um, main areas we do work in is the Queenby and CBD area, and which, as Bryce has mentioned before, we have two award-winning parks, um, our main town park and Queen Elizabeth Park, in which we did have the Green Flag Award um, two years running. We've also got many other smaller parks, and, and we do a lot in those in the CBD area. Just coming out from the seated area, we've got a nearby Gugong housing estate, which is very much up and going with new areas coming online all the time. It ha will have its own little town centre out there um, in which you'll maintain and look after extensive parks and gardens <laughs> there. There's also another new housing estate called South Jarabumbra. That is now just in construction. There's houses already built there, but what they're doing at the moment is construct a new town park, which will be very exciting, um, which will be cafes, little shops, everyone for everyone to go down and meet. Um, they're also creating a lovely dog park, landscaped, which um, dogs can play, the kids can play, and also incorporating an orchard. Further down from that little area will be an open parkland type areas with landscape ponds, which you can go for an afternoon walk and walk around. So that, that's coming on in probably in about two years' time. That'll be ready up and going. So we'll have um, some trainees down there helping out. We also do trips to nearby towns. Um, we've got Bungadore very close, in which every year we put the, um, well, actually twice a year, we put the annuals in for them. And we we go out to Braidwood as well. And just recently we went out to Braidwood and we helped prune one of a uh, very, very old wisteria that just needed a bit of attention. 
it was um, going unruly and we've just now started to get back back in order. Um, so um, over to you, Nicole. Where have you worked and what skills have you picked up? Uh, so in my year and a half or so, I've worked in Google, CBD and currently in the Senior Horticultural Crew. Um, the skills that I've gained is plant ID and plant selection. In the last probably eight months, I've really started to come into my ID of plants and feeling quite confident about my plant ID, which is really exciting. It makes me feel really smart. She, <laughs> uh, <laughs> she walks around and she's telling me all the names of plants as we're doing jobs, so that's really good. <laughs> Who's training who? Uh, correct pruning and maintenance. As Rod said, we went and tamed the wild beast of this very old wisteria. We also maintain and prune uh, small, large shrubs, small, large trees, uh, and just maintaining all the all the plants. Um, in the winter time to keep warm, we do a lot of transplanting and mulching to really make the area nice and fresh and beautiful. Um, plant health, so observing and implementing uh, plant health. So the other day we were doing a little blow run and noticed that one of the hedges at QEP was looking quite shabby. Had a look at that and found that it had aphids and scale. So we did a uh, eco treatment on that one and we'll continue to do an eco treatment and observation of the pests and disease. Uh, we do a lot of garden renovations. We just did a big renovation at the Star Garden. We're going to start doing some plant selection for that one soon. Uh, we fiddle around with uh, irrigation, which is an important part of parks and gardens. Chainsawing, again, so fun. Um, and you get to operate such an array of different machinery from big mowers, little mowers, in small spaces to big open grass spaces, uh, whip snippers, um, edges, and we just used a vent track, which I just learned aerates the soil, which was really cool. And Ron, what projects have we been a part of? Oh, projects. Well, a couple of years ago when I first started the we, I helped do the design and the construction and the also implementation of the irrigation of a place called Ruston House. Long time back, Ruston House was um, one of the, well, the first hospital here, I think, in uh, Queanbeyan. And then they built the big new hospital next door. And then over time, Ruston House went into a bit of disrepair. And then it was then renovated and brought up to this beautiful art gallery now. It's an old sandstone building. So then we did the gardens outside and selected the plants to go in keeping with that age of building. So that, that came up really well and it's looking really good now. Um, we've also done just recently a lot of tree planting in our new area, which is a world-class regional sports centre down near South, South Gerobromba. So we planted over 80 trees there. Um, and then we just now got to do the follow-up um, light pruning to get them going the right direction and watering going into this summer. We do a lot of renovation on existing gardens because we've had some really nice gardens put in probably 10 years ago. So they just need to just, just have a little bit done to them, refreshed up with new plants, new mulch, make sure the irrigation is working. And then just only a week or so ago, we helped out and planted a lot of native trees along our Queanbeyan River corridor. So that's so we 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 do a lot of a lot of different things here. Um, with all those extra projects, we there's also extra skills that you're learning, not just your your normal gardening skills. And then from that, Nicole, you did some extra learning yourself, didn't you? Yeah. So. As a trainee gardener, you have the opportunity to go out to Governor General's house in Canberra for three months. Uh, very specialised, beautiful, high-profile gardens there. Um, so that's a really, really special opportunity that I don't think that you would normally get. So it's, that's really that's a really big positive. Um, a really awesome 
new upcoming project that we have coming up as well. We get to be a part of establishing a microforest in Queanbeyan at Blackwall Park, which will actually be only one of five in all of Australia. So that is very, very exciting. I'm really excited for that one. Um, and, yeah, over to you, Rod. Yeah, so just to sort of close up, we've got two trainee um, ships um, opportunities um, available now. And as Bryce has mentioned, one's going to be situated in Bungendore and the other one will be situated in this Queen Bean area. Um, and then once you've finished that traineeship, well, there's future opportunities to continue on here in Queanbeyan Council. But also you've done so much learning, so much um, extra study, and you've, you can certainly leave here and go to a lot of local government, um, local government jobs. Certainly a lot of private businesses out there that you can go into. Um, and then also, look, you can work in nurseries, do propagation. You can then work in beautiful botanical gardens would be a great opportunity. And just lastly, look, you just never stop learning. So I think that's, that's it, Bryce. Great. Thank you, guys. That was awesome. Um, another fun fact I'll just uh, quickly highlight. So you can see the contact officer there, Sean Caden, who's the coordinator of this particular section. Um, he's got a, <clears throat> excuse me, he's got a great success story himself. He actually started out as a horticulture trainee many, many years ago, and now he's running the show. So that's a prime example of the kind of things that you can achieve here at QPRC, which is awesome. <clears throat> All right. Next off the rank, we've got our trainee water and sewer. Um, and Ken, ooh, yep. And Kenny Pierce will be here to talk about this one. Hi guys, thanks Bryce. Um, thanks everybody uh, for coming along. Uh, my name's Ken Pierce. I'm the coordinator of operations on the eastern side of the QPRC. Um, so basically, I'm um, looking after the water sewer side of things out in the townships of Bungendore, Braywood, and Captain's Flat. Um, so the utilities team falls in the infrastructure. Um, the vision of the council. Um, so just to give you an idea of some of the um, infrastructure assets that we um, operate and maintain, um, QPRC has approximately about 16 different reservoir sites um, throughout the council. Um, some of them sites have multiple reservoir sites. Um, we have five different sewage treatment plant facilities. Um, we also have four water treatment facilities and approximately 38 um, sewer pump station sites throughout the council. Uh, we also have um, storage dams um, out at Captain's Flat. We have an 820 meg storage dam for water supply out that way. Um, we have earthen bank storage dam over in Braidwood that's based at the foot of the water treatment plant. Um, we have a river pump station on the Shoalhaven River out that way. So we have a fair bit of asset. Um, along with all them plants and sites, we also then have all the reticulated um, pipe work lines within the townships of Queanbeyan, Bungendore, Braidwood and Captain's Flat. That's water and sewer main um, that takes a fair bit of um, maintenance and then with that we also are always put a new asset in the ground as well so that sort of gives us a brief um, of, of the sites and the infrastructure we're looking after uh, in regards to the works that our trainee would be doing out in the Bungendore Braywood area as I say we have um, four water treatment facilities between the, um, the three townships uh, with variant different process um, in the plants. We have a dissolved air uh, flotation fueling plant in Braidwood. We've got a small uh, membrane, ultra membrane facility in Captain's Flat for water treatment. We also um, have two different water treatment facilities within the Bungendore region. 
Uh, one of them's a clarification sedimentation and the other plan is a aeration facility. Um, so the trainee would be working throughout um, these plants. And also we have the three sewage treatment plants. So the trainee would be working alongside the qualified operators within them plants um, and doing variant roles within there. Um, he would also be, or she would be, the applicant, um, would also be working within the reticulated crews also out in the, on the water mains, sewer mains. They could be doing um, service connections. They could be doing uh, mains repairs, whether that be on the water mains or sewer mains, clearing blockages on sewer mains. Um, they could be mowing grass within the treatment plant facilities. There's a variant lots of work um, that is undertaken throughout all these um, facilities. Uh, some of the training that would be involved um, that we'd be looking, you'd have to undertake um, in the couple of years would be, obviously there'd be the Cert 3, Cert 4 water operations ticket. Now within that, um, you'd be looking to do the part one, two uh, of the water and the part one, two of the sewer um, within the department primary industry environment of the water treatment operator courses. There's also uh, the monitor and operator fluoride addition to the water supply. There's dam safety management course we'd be looking to get you on. Uh, operate and control liquefied gas um, disinfection systems, traffic control, confined spaces, uh, working at heights. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a position that at the end of it, you will be um, very well qualified um, within the field of water and sewer operations because our job out here, you need to be well qualified in the tasks that we undertake. Um, in regards to uh, what we're looking for from the candidate, I can tell you we're looking to try and get a, a motivated, enthusiastic individual who's performance driven, uh, somebody that can work well within a team environment and help that team achieve favourable outcomes. Um, somebody that enjoys working within the fields of laboratory works, data recording, working within mechanical and electrical, um, plumbing, landscaping, uh, as I say, there's multiple skills that are required. And that's why I believe the water and sewer is the most fantastic job on the council. I'm sorry to everybody else here tonight, but hopefully the cadets will see that, that our sort of work is, is the most enjoyable. It's an essential service for the community. And um, it really is an enjoyable job to get your teeth into um, once you're doing it. Our team is a small team. Um, so you'd be coming into a small group of people. Uh, it's a dynamic team. Um, as I say, they've got a diverse range of work. They need a diverse range of skills. Um, and at the end of the day, we're out there to provide safe drinking water for the community um, and a safe um, water quality that we're putting back into the environment. Um, and that's what we're looking to achieve and we look to achieve it with a smile on our face and, um, and as I say, a good team spirit. So I'm hopeful that we'll get a lot of people that, that are looking to sign up for us and, um, and hopefully it'll be an enjoyable experience for them. So I think that's about all I've got to offer and I hope I get a few questions at the end of, at the, end of the talk. So thank you and back to you, Bryce. Great, thanks for that, Ken. I'm going to throw a question your way. So you built a pretty impressive, um, I guess, succession planning system through your team. So from completing a traineeship like this, where do you see the career path for someone after they've completed the traineeship? Ideally, um, ideally at the end of the couple of years, I would be very hopeful that, that our um, trainee has well worked well within the team to, to his, that they've built up 
a good camaraderie with with the team itself that their skill level is is of a high skill set and and continuing on i would love to think that that the way our facilities are growing and the, and the towns are growing that i would then have a position that that person um we would have the position open for them to stay on as a permanent and hopefully they would like to stay on and continue their work with us that that is my hope um so that's where i would like to see it go yeah thanks for that that's awesome so i guess the way the team structure in ken's area works um so from completing a um, a traineeship you can move right up to a general equipment operator and from there on water and sewer operators and maintaining our um, sewage and water treatment plants, all that kind of thing. And then potentially right up to a leadership level, which is where Kenny's landed himself there, which is really good. All right. On to the next position that we have here, which is going to be uh, one of the most competitive ones that we've got, which is great. Um, so it's the trainee administration um, position in our water, sorry, <laughs> in our planning and building section. And I'll hand over to Shannon Edwards, who is the team leader at that section. Thanks, Bryce. Thanks, everyone, for making the time to come along tonight. Um, so we've been asked to give you a bit of an overview of the role. So I've just got some notes here. Um, so we, uh, my team, um, we're the admin team in the development and environment section, and we provide a high level of administrative support to a wide variety of technical officers, such as town planning, who you'll hear from shortly, building surveying, who you're also going to hear from, uh, development engineering and environmental health. There are also others, but they're the key ones that we work with in the admin team. Um, the admin team represent council working directly with the community to assist with lodging building applications um, for renovations or new developments, uh, as well as developing uh, new subdivisions such as Gugong and Charlie, which have been mentioned um, by the previous presentations. Um, and also the parks team, which uh, Rod mentioned in his presentation, so the dog park that all comes through our department. So we give approval for the designs and we issue the approvals and that's something that my team has a big role in. Um, we get to learn about the various stages of development as well as sustainability initiatives with our environmental health team and obviously um, sustainable building and um, also environmental health matters. So the river um, is looked after by our environmental health team um, and we get to see you know, what's happening with the platypus and um, any initiatives there. Um, to make that a great place for the community. Um, we build a strong understanding of local government in the admin team um, because we get to learn about all the different areas of council and the way that they keep the town running and growing in line with legislation that council uh, works underneath. Uh, we gain a lot of experience in working with, oh, sorry, I've already said that point. Um, there are also sometimes opportunities to be seconded to different areas of council. So um, administration is a really great way to explore your career options in local government as we engage with so many different teams. Some of the ones that you're hearing from tonight, um, we engage with them. Uh, and as Bryce mentioned at the beginning, council roles are incredibly diverse. So admin's a really great way to sort of get in, um, get some skills that will work and they're very transferable skills, admin, um, and you use them in, in any role that you would apply for in the future. Um, the exciting parts of the role. So I asked my team actually today to um, give you a bit of a wider perspective and I'll just read you some of the responses. So um, we work with fun and a diverse range of people, both uh, external and internal. Uh, while there are some tasks with a repetitive nature as part of our role just to keep things running, uh, every day brings variety and presents new learning and problem solving opportunities, which is a really great skill to build in business. Um, the challenge of working with competing deadlines, um, sometimes we like that, sometimes <laughs> it, um, it does push us to grow, which is great, and it's a really great skill to learn for any business again. We play a key role in public relations of council and helping community members to navigate the complexities of the development system. So we get everyone from big developers who do this every day, builders, to your mum and dad type builders who have never done an application to council and they need assistance. So we, we support all of those people, which is a really great um, opportunity to help out. Um, we also uh, get the inside scoop on new developments and businesses around town, which is pretty exciting. Um, and we see a tangible result. So for example, a building or a new regional sporting complex like 
uh, what's happening at the moment out towards Tralee, a heritage sensitive renovation like uh, Rod mentioned with Ruston House um, and a whole new suburb. So knowing that you help make that happen is, um, is pretty cool and recognising the important role that each person in the immediate and wider team plays in bringing someone's vision or design to life, keeping the region activated and sustainable. So that's a little insight into the admin area in development and environment. Um, it's a really great place to work. We have yeah, new things happening all the time and we really know what's happening ahead of, ahead of everyone else. So that's, that's a pretty cool part of the role. So welcome any questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. I'll throw one question your way. Sure. Um, what kind of support would the successful candidate expect to receive um, during their time doing the traineeship? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got um, team members from varying backgrounds. Um, and so we are obviously they're doing their training through council that you've mentioned um, where it's fully supported, but they will also learn from the people around them um, and obviously the study leave is another great opportunity so we would allow that time but you're actually getting to use those skills that you're um, learning about in real time so yeah that's something that would um, would be a great support to someone learning um, business admin. Great thanks for that Shannon appreciate it. That's okay. You're welcome. Alrighty, so we move on to the next position, which is the Cadet Building Surveyors, and we've got two of those. And presenting this position will be Vesna, so I'll hand over to her. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Bryce. Okay, so um, we have two Cadet Building positions available at the moment, and we have three Cadets in total. So we do have one awesome cadet at the moment. Um, the building team consists of a coordinator, a senior building surveyor, that's me, and five building surveyors. And we also have three cadets. Um, so we have one cadet at the moment and two positions that have been vacated because one of them actually has uh, gained a position here at council as a building surveyor. So that's very exciting. And the other one left for a position in Sydney, um, Bondi, Waverley Council. Yeah, so um, our, our, our cadets are very sought after. We do really enjoy training them. And um, yeah, they're really a very important part of our team. So um, Okay, what do we do? So a lot of people don't know what building surveyors do. So they used to be called building inspectors. That kind of explains what we do. But we also assess, so we assess build applications for building work. We um, check that they meet current legislation um, and that at the end of it, you'll have a safe and healthy building to live in or work in. We inspect buildings at various stages of construction. For example, the steel in the slab, the framework, the waterproofing before you put your tiles down in your bathroom and plumbing and drainage as well. We also inspect swimming pools and buildings that haven't had approval. Okay, so... For me, the best thing about being a building surveyor is that we're not stuck in an office all day. That's not for me. So, I mean, um, it's great to get outside. We, we're, we're both inside and outside. So we inspect outside, we come back in, we, we have paperwork to do from inspections, we have assessments to do and um, lots of variety. It's, it's never boring, that's for sure. We look at applications here from houses and sheds to places of worship, shops, public halls, factories, basically everything that's been built. Um, and we do cover the whole of the Queen Bean Palarang council area and that extends, oh gosh, I think we saw the map earlier. It's, it's a long way. Uh, some days we do a lot of, a lot of country driving. So, I did ask our current cadet, Seb, and also our previous cadet, 
Sam what they why why they chose building surveying and why they came to Queen Bin and what they think of it and what they thought of their experience here. Um, and these are some of the things they said. The hours are good. The team is supportive and everyone helps each other out. Everyone is generous with their time and kind. Um, you get to study while council pays for everything. Um, you get to explore the building industry and do everything from assessment to finalising a building. So you get to see what you approved originally and you get to actually see the finished product out on site. Um, and you use what you learn to study and you use what you study practically here in the office and on site. Um, yeah, QP QPRC really does put a lot of time and effort into training, training trainees and cadets, and they really are a valuable part of our team. Um, Seb went on holidays to Europe for, a, I think it was a few months earlier this year, and we really missed him, like, personally, and actually all the work that he does for us, so very valuable. And, yeah, we hope we out of this we can get a couple of new people that will be able to join our team and help us out, and we can help them out. That's, thank you. Great, thanks for that Vesna. I'm glad that you noted um, just some of the places that our former cadets have gone to, where they've actually gone to land permanent jobs with council, which is really exciting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Thanks. All righty, so on to the next one. We have a cadet town planner within the same department, our building and planning section. And I'll hand over to Lucille to give an overview of what that one looks like. Thank you, Bryce. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. Now, don't be alarmed, but no one knows what town planners do. I've only ever met one town planner not through work. And when I say I'm a town planner, I usually get a blank stare. So if you don't know what it is, um, explore it because it is a very exciting career. There's, there are two streams in town planning. I'll just briefly touch on strategic planning and then our section here does something called development assessment, which is a little bit finer detail. But the strategic planning area, that the idea is about where people, where people live, um, how they live, the placement of towns um, and the services and the things that they need to, to live well in those towns. Um, you might have seen some images of, of European cities with very, very grand avenues. Um, I mean, the War Memorial and Anzac Parade in Canberra are examples that the idea of, of the church or the state imposing, you know, structures and, and um, places in towns to make you feel um, almost insignificant. Some of these things were quite intentional. Um, and the idea about the placement of things and towns and how people live is really the basis of, of the career that I'm in. You might also want to think about, um, say, Canberra and the retail centres. You have a very large urban centre that is designed to accommodate, you know, basically every service or shop you can imagine, and, and that's civic. And then it, it filters down to, to group centres where you have a lot of services that you need locally. And then even further down, you'll have lo a local centre or local shops. So it's that sort of idea about placement. Um, that's the strategic planning side of, of planning. For us in development assessment, we assess development applications. So it is applicant driven. We look at, as, as ha has been touched on tonight, there are some new large urban release areas on, on our fringes here. So Gugong is a significant one. South Charlie, which is on the, the border with Canberra at Hume and North Elmsley, North Bungendore are our main ones at the moment. So what we do there is we look at 
applications and how that proposal will work in the in the public space. So that application is lodged by a private developer or a private builder, but we need to be conscious of how it works in in the public space. Um, a good tangible example that I use is is fencing front fencing. You'll notice that in most places in Australia, we don't have solid front fencing. Um, and that's quite intentional that the space between someone's private home and the public spaces on the street um, are blurred. It, it provides um, surveillance to the street and also to the home. People might think, oh, but I want, you know, security and I want a great big fence and, and to feel protected. Um, but there's a balance there about um, what is the best private outcome and what is the best public outcome. So in a nutshell, that's, that's sort of some of the concepts. Um, what we do then with our applications is, is look at, um, firstly, whether they're in an urban area or a rural area, because how those developments operate um, vary quite significantly. So we've touched on the urban things, fencing, um, streetscape, privacy, overshadowing, landscaping. In our rural areas, which is, um, which is great here at council because we have such a, such a range to work on, not only are you looking at those things, but you need to be mindful of potential bushfire risk. Um, would, your, would, would the development, if approved, require vegetation clearing and what's the impact on flora and fauna? Um, a lot of those, well, those rural areas are not serviced by effluent disposal um, like we have in town. So how's that going to work? So there's a lot of um, technical aspects to work through. Um, and a little bit of a, of a feeling about the greater good. How do we make this work for everyone? Um, the neighbours, especially, you know, for things like overshadowing or privacy. In our office here, we have 10 in the team. We have one cadet at the moment. Um, he's applied for a position, a, a more permanent position, which is exciting. We're, we're you know, um, we've got some positions open as well as this cadet one. Um, our previous cadet, Casey, she was um, awarded a position in the state government in the Department of Education. Um, so that was very exciting for her. In terms of, you know, physically our work, we're, we're in the office, but we also go out and do site inspections, which is good. We have a little bit of a work from home roster as well to just help with that um, work-life balance. Um, look, look up the degree and, and what's involved because it is, it is quite diverse. Um, you do a little bit of sort of natural resources planning, urban economics, which is interesting, um, surveying. So um, look, it, it's a very, very broad field. As I said, our area here is in development assessment, which is very, very busy. It's demanding. Um, but it's very supportive. Um, we'll always be there to sort of pick up the pieces and there's plenty of seniors if something goes wrong, um, which sometimes it does. Um, and, and so we're all learning um, and working with great people like Besna and Shannon and Bryce and others. Great, thanks for that. There's always work happening in town planning, which is great. Um, I think I saw a statistic somewhere that Quamby and Palarang, uh, the region itself, um, is second or third in New South Wales for some of the most regional development or most economic development generally, um, which is pretty exciting for the region with things like Trialee and Gugong going on, um, where there's lots of work and lots of assessments to go through, which is great. All right, thank you for that, Lucille. And last but not least, we have the cadet project accountant, which our chief financial officer, uh, Tracy, will be going through now. So I'll hand over to her. Thank you, Bryce. Yes, so I think it's fitting that uh, the project accountant role and the finance team uh, present last. Uh, we are responsible for providing all of the teams that you've just been hearing from um, with sufficient budget to allow them to deliver the services that they need to for the community. So part of this role for the project accountant, while you're learning 
uh, your technical skills at university. On a day-to-day -day basis, you will be working with a broader finance team to apply those technical skills to multiple different scenarios, multiple different areas of the business, which is quite challenging and exciting at times as well. So you'll be working with a broader finance team who have a large range of experience, skills, qualifications. So they'll be able to support you in your application of what you're learning at university uh, into your day-to-day -day work. So some of the work that we do is working with the teams that uh, you've just heard from in helping them to set their budgets, monitor their budgets, and ensure that they are delivering the services that the community wants. The community tells us what they want. We develop plans. We need to make sure that we deliver those plans in a cost-effective and efficient manner. So we need to make sure that the funding that we're getting from our community, that we manage that in the most appropriate way. So part of this role, we'll be working on some of the bigger projects um, and some smaller projects that council undertakes. For example, we could be working with the gardeners and making sure that they've got sufficient budget for uh, the maintenance of certain parks throughout the LGA. And then on the other side, we could be working with the water and sewer team to um, on the projects such as building a new sewer treatment plant. So the experience that you'll get from this role is rather varied and extensive, um, but very exciting as well to be a part of. So once again, as being part of the finance team, we'll be able to help you to apply your technical accounting skills, but also learn those softer skills by working with other teams, understanding their business and providing the financial support and guidance that those teams need to deliver these services. So I'm really excited to be a part of the finance team and my role, I've been with local government for over 20 years and I love being able to deliver services for our community, just not on that day-to-day -day, uh, front-facing, community-facing uh, basis. I work with all the people who do, and I wanna be able to support those people to, or our staff to deliver all the services that the community wants. So I'm really looking forward to having a cadet accountant join our team. I myself started as a cadet accountant, and worked my way up all the way through to the Chief Finance Officer. So don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. So thank you. Great, thanks for that, Tracy. Now, isn't that just a success story from cadet all the way to CFO? That's crazy. <laughs> and there's so many stories like that from so many of our managers and coordinators, and even some of our directors that started in local government as a cadet or a trainee, and now they're running the show, which is really exciting. And we're able to be part of that and support them getting to that point. All right, so we've heard from the positions. I'm conscious of time. I just wanna run through a couple of things like how to apply, um, how to get ahead in the game when you go to apply, all that kind of thing. And then we'll open up the floor to questions. So just briefly, <clears throat> some examples or success stories. I know you've already heard some, um, but here are some of our folk. I mean, just two of 30 something trainees that were, and cadets who have had come through that are now in um, another position in council, which is really exciting. One of which is Liam O'Grady. So he started in our, um, our depot as the trainee administrative assistant. Um, from there, after he completed his traineeship, he was then one of our customer service officers. He had a stint in transport ranger, and now he's well established as our digital mobile technology officer. So he's in charge of distribution of our, um, our digital assets, pretty much. So laptops, phones, all that kind of stuff. Um, and he's really enjoying that, which is great. Um, Elise as well. So she started in our, <coughs> excuse me, development engineering section as a cadet engineer. And since then, she's been promoted multiple times within that team, as you can see, um, to the assistant development engineer, and now she's a development engineer as well. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, I myself, I started as a trainee in our HR team. Um, I mean, when I first started council, I started in our customer service team in the call center, and I always had my eyes on HR, um, and I was able to land the HR trainee job um, and get to the role that I'm in now, which is the team leader of um, our recruitment um, section. Kimberly as well, um, she started with me at coincidentally the same time as a trainee, and now she's acting learning and development officer, which is just so exciting that local governments out of us will QPRC is able to support these kind of opportunities. All right, so on to benefits that we offer. Um, there's a lot going on in this space, which is really good. And our team have really worked hard to build up the benefits that we offer um, to our staff um, to make us an employer of choice. So we've talked a lot about the professional mentorship and support. Um, you'll see that a key theme through here is that our cadet and trainees um, are mentored and they're supported to get them to the point that they need to be. Um, another great thing that we offer is social club, which a lot of our staff take part in to really add that intrinsic value um, to take home. And they do some pretty cool stuff. I mean, we, <laughs> I think we had an archery competition one year. Um, we go out to dinner frequently. Um, I think a couple of weeks ago they did dragon boating. It's just really cool to be part of that kind of thing, which is good. Uh, we also offer discounted gym memberships in our local area. Um, that's something that I take benefit of, and it is great. <laughs> um, gym is not cheap, um, so it's good to be able to get a discount on it. Another great thing that we have is the Rural Management Challenge. That's also something that I've taken part in. Um, it's effectively where rural councils such as ourselves compete against each other. Uh, in a challenge-like format, we come together. Um, we have we set up a team, um, compete in some pretty challenging scenarios. Um, and I really, from my own personal experience, got a lot out of that. And it's really sort of framed how I approach work today. And it was good to network with other councils, um, which was great. Kim talked a bit about our learning and development opportunities. I think when I last checked on our portal, um, there's 130 different learning and development or training courses available to our staff, be it whether it's online um, or face-to-face -face in one of our classroom settings. It's just insane the amount of stuff that we offer in this space, whether it be business writing, we offer recruitment and selection training to our managers, um, mental health awareness, all this kind of thing. Um, that's something that we're really proud of. Um, health and wellbeing programs are on offer as well, which our WHS team look after. Health and wellbeing generally is a real focal point for this council, as we talked about earlier. Um, we've also talked about study time, providing work hours um, to our cadets and trainees to catch up um, on, on your studies, um, which again, when I was a trainee, I found that really beneficial. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm doing studies outside of a traineeship now, um, but when I remember when I was a trainee um, and being able to do study at work and then just being able to go see the HR coordinator with some complex question that I was working on um, in my studies, I found that really helpful. And then finally, another thing that we offer is the diversity and inclusion group, which is a group um, that's relatively new. It's been around one or two years uh, in the grand scheme of things. And their whole purpose is to make sure um, that we are employing people into a safe and equitable workplace. Um, that's a really passionate group as well. And another thing that we're really proud of. All right, so on to the recruitment process, the thing everyone wants to hear about. Um, so being a local government organization, uh, we have a legislative requirement to appoint or merit. Um, so that's really important to take note of. So I'll just briefly go over what some of these steps involve. So obviously, we're at step one at the moment, which is advertising the job. Um, so it's all available on our careers page, the careers portal. Um, then the panel, usually a selection panel of three, will shortlist to get that number down um, to a select few um, that they want to interview, which takes us into step three. So we obviously interview. Um, after interview, we're doing reference checks of the preferred candidate or candidates, depending on whether we've got multiple positions available. Um, we're preparing a panel report, which just summarizes um, who we wish to proceed with. Um, where necessary, uh, we might need to take a pre undertake a pre-employment medical or a medical declaration. So if the traineeship or cadetship is a bit more physically demanding, um, such as um, Kenny's water and sewer trainee or Rod's um, tra uh, gardener trainee. Um, those roles are a little bit more physically demanding and obviously would require pre-employment medical. For those that aren't, it's just a medical declaration process, which is super simple, just to make sure you can physically fit and able to do the job. 
Um, for some roles, it requires a criminal history check for any roles that have access to large sums of money. So obviously for Tracy's um, accountant role, that's a no-brainer. Um, and then finally, we're, after we've done all our checks and balances, we're in a position to make a letter of offer and then eventually commencement, which is really exciting. So applying for our vacancies on the next slide. Super important to note, as you can see, the first stop point there is to take note of the closing date. Um, it's always a bit awkward when you come in and uh, after, after the job is closed and ask for a late application. <laughs> so just really important to take note of the closing date. Um, and again, if you go to the QPRC website, um, there's a big purple button there staring in the face that says careers. So make sure to um, click on that one as well and apply through the careers portal. Um, after you've entered in some information, um, the screening questions will appear, which just refers to your eligibility to work in Australia, whether you identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, all that kind of thing. Now, when you're applying, this is super important to take note of. We're after three key documents. So we want your resume, cover letter, and your address of the selection criteria. For those that might have applied with private industry before or that kind of thing, um, addressing the selection criteria might be a bit new to you, which is all good. Um, for us and um, APS do this kind of thing as well. The selection criteria effectively refers to a set of criteria um, that determine whether or not you're um, would be considered eligible for a particular role. And that can always be found in the position description. So when you click on the advertisement, um, you'll see that there will be some job attachments there. So the advertisement itself, model job demands, checklist, et cetera, et cetera. And one of those documents will be the position description. Always good to have a read over that. Um, if you're unsure about what the role does um, or what clarification um, outside of what we've talked about here today, but there will be a heading that says selection criteria and there are about six to eight questions in there and we'll need you to upload a document um, addressing the selection criteria and how you've actually um, gained those skills and demonstrated those skills. So on the topic of selection criteria, there is actually a guide in the job attachment section of the advertisement itself. Uh, which is a PDF document there, which actually goes over how to address the selection criteria. So you won't feel sort of lost on how to do it because we've included some examples in there of how to do it. Um, and also we recommend the STAR method. So situation, task, action, and result. My biggest bit of advice for applying for any job, whether it be us or someone else, is your application must be evidence-based. So if you're going to make a statement that you've, um, you've got a particular skill or a particular quality, make sure you back that up with an example of... Um, how you've attained that skill and how you've demonstrated it and how you can apply that into this particular job. So that's that. So we'll move on to the next one. But if you take anything away from that particular slide, um, super important to address that selection criteria. Um, and on the website as well, um, there is a email address that goes to my team and we're pretty active on that um, email inbox as well. So if you do have any questions, feel free to shoot us an email. Um, but our phone number is also on there and we're always happy to help if you're struggling to prepare an application or that kind of thing. There's plenty of resources available um, to do well in that sense. But to get you ahead of the game um, in applying for these jobs, because these cadet and traineeships um, in our experience are very competitive, because at the end of the day, the biggest selling point is that we're paying for your, your training and getting on the job experience. So when you're done your cadet and traineeship, what you find or what we find is that you're extremely employable and you'll become very competitive in the market. Um, so naturally, these opportunities are very competitive. So if you want to get ahead of the game, just make sure you're uploading three documents, your resume, cover letter, and address of that selection criteria. And lastly, before I open up the floor to questions, um, so there's a QR code there of how to access our careers page. Um, and there is the email address and phone number I mentioned. If you're interested in any more technical questions about the cadet and traineeship um, programs and study opportunities, all that kind of thing, um, Kimberly's number's on there as well if you want to get in touch with her. Um, but either one that you contact will be able to help and answer those questions. All righty. So I will answer the questions or direct them where they need to go. Uh, in the chat box first. And then um, if you want to ask a question verbally, um, just put your hand up in the, the uh, reactions section there at the bottom and I'll, um, I'll get to you when I can. So uh, Tatiana, I'm hoping, hoping I'm pronouncing that correct. 
says, do you require Australian citizenship or a permanent residency enough? So the benefit of local government, we're not quite APS, where you need to be a citizen to work for us. Um, you can be a permanent resident, have a, a valid working visa or, or be a citizen. Um, the main criteria being is that you're found suitable for the job, but those are three different um, categories that we can take into account um, if you are a permanent resident and all that kind of stuff. So that's the key difference between APS and us, um, which is really good. If you do um, have a working visa, um, in some cases, we will be able to offer a fixed term arrangement up until the expiration of your working visa. Um, but that will be a discussion with the selection panel if you're found suitable for that particular role. But that's a really good question. All right, Sarah has asked, are the traineeships only available to year 12 students finishing school or you consider a year 11 student wanting to finish school and start a traineeship or apprenticeship? I might actually divert this one to Kim, if that's all right, if you're still around, Kim. Um, so I think the law is that you have to actually be... Um, you have to have completed year 10 or 17, whichever one comes first, um, and you have to be um, signed up to do a course through TAFE, um, I believe. So if you're in year 11 and you're wanting to finish school, I think as long as you are enrolled in a course um, and you have a full-time job, you're able to um, apply for one of our traineeships. There's no actual age limit on it. And Kim, I'm going to throw another one your way. I think that's okay. also from Sarah. Um, what is the eligibility criteria for a Cert 4? Um, so I believe that it is as long as you don't have, say, if you're going into a business admin role and you have a master's in admin and you're going to do the certificate for, unfortunately, you wouldn't be eligible for that. So as long as you don't have any qualifications in that area that is relevant, um, you'll be eligible for to be able to enroll in the Cert 4. Great. Thanks for that. So I think I'm hoping I've got everyone in the chat box there. My pleasure, Tatiana. I'm glad I got your name right there. <laughs> um, so if anyone wants to ask a verbal question, now's your time to shine. So feel free to put your hand up um, using the reaction section. It took me a little while to figure that one out. Um, but yeah, if you've got a question, feel free to put your hand up. All of our managers are here still um, and are available to answer questions if you like. Maybe not. No one wants to ask a question before we wrap up for tonight. All right. No worries. If you do have a question after this um, or you think of a question, um, don't panic. Um, you've got our contact details there. Feel free to take a photo of the details there if you need. Um, get in touch. If it's a question about the job itself, uh, we'll direct it to where it needs to go to the manager of that particular section so they can answer. But if it's more sort of generic questions about how the recruitment process works, eligibility like Kim has answered, um, anything to do with citizenship or that kind of thing, um, that's something that my team can look after. Um, and as you might have noticed uh, when you came in, the session is being um, recorded just in case you wanted to have a look over anything that's um, been said today just as a reminder. So. For all those that have come along, thank you for registering. We'll send you a copy of the recording when we can. Um, and yeah, this is a program that my team is really proud of um, because as of the main theme that we've been talking about all the way through this is that it's about giving those employment opportunities to our local community to the point where they come in as a cadet or a trainee and they end up um, uh, going all the way uh, to being a leader in the organization, which is really exciting. I've just noted a question that's come in from Kirby. So Kirby says, I already have a degree in architecture in the Philippines and currently studying a diploma in building and construction. Will I be eligible for a cadet town planner or building surveyor? All righty. So he's targeted two people on this one, Vesna or Lucille. Did you want to chime in on this one? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, we quite regularly get people, um, Kirby, with backgrounds like yours. 
uh, my understanding is that the cadet town planner one, you would need to be enrolled in a town planning degree. So I'm not quite sure what the building and construction diploma is. So that, that's the only um, point where I think um, Bryce's team might need to help out with that. What we could do, Kirby, so you've got our contact details there. If you want to actually send through the details of your qualification, because um, the challenge that we have um, that we noted a bit earlier is that building codes differ um, across different countries. Um, so what we have in Australia might not be quite the same as what um, they've got over in the Philippines. Um, so it, it could potentially be something that we could still accommodate through a cadetship program, um, but that's something that we'll be able to confirm if you're able to send through those details to that careers inbox and we'll have that discussion. I hope that sort of answers that question. <laughs> All right, last call for any questions before we wrap up for tonight. Cool. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, we really appreciate your time um, and interest in these really exciting opportunities that we've got going on. Um, as I said, if you do have any questions or wanted to get in touch, um, there's our contact details there. Um, and just remember those three key documents that we're after when you apply. Um, the resume, cover letter, and selection criteria. Um, these are super competitive opportunities, um, and that's how you sort of get ahead of the pack. Um, and get your application noticed a bit more. So thank you all for your time and uh, hopefully we'll see an application from you.